G'day. This month, the live track is Celebrity Disorder from the new album, Bang Operative. I want to look at the patch bay and how I use it in the studio. I'll also touch on some of the patches that I use to build the track. My studio is 8th inch jack standard. All external hardware appears at the patch bay. This is for ease, but it's also to encourage me to use the gear, because if it's right there in front of me, I'm going to use it. The K2000 has four audio outputs. All of them appear at the patch bay. The Emulator 4 has six audio outputs that appear at the patch bay. The Emacs keyboard also has six audio outputs. They also appear at the patch bay. The Emacs rack has four audio outputs. It also has one input for trigger or clock and one input for CV. That's right, the Emacs digital sampler can be controlled with control voltage, which I think is the greatest thing on earth. The Moog Voyager has two audio outputs and one audio input. This is so you can actually route stuff around before it hits the filters, which is amazing. The BeatStep Pro has a whole bunch of trig outputs, gate outputs, clock inputs, clock outputs, all that sort of fun stuff. You get the picture. Basically, everything arrives at that patch bay so I can use the entire studio like one big modular synthesizer. I can patch in, out, through, all over the place. It's great fun. Plus, I've thrown several guitar pedals and other random stuff into the mix as well, just to add some flavor. So for example, I can take the signal out of the Moog Voyager, I can route it through the old Korg digital delay, put a big flanging chorus on it, then I can route it back into the Moog before it goes to the VCAs and the filter. So therefore the sound's actually built into the Moog. There's also a bank of eight compressors. Normally a compressor is the last thing in the signal path. You compress it, sidechain it, whatever, then you send it out to the desk. But with this system, I can actually use the compressors inside the signal path. For example, with the Vakoda, I can pull in the pad sounds, add compression, and then throw that into the Vakoda so that what's being Vakoded is a smooth sound. Now, if you're crazy enough to want to do this in your studio, here's some suggestions that'll make your life easier. Use good quality plugs as Cheapo ones are going to die really fast. You're going to be using them all the time, so make sure they're really good quality. Also, make sure that the hex nut is on the front, not on the back, because back hex nuts are really difficult for maintenance. And trust me, there's going to be a lot of maintenance. Make each instrument have its own panel. So all the Moog stuff is on the one panel, all the Emacs keyboard is on one panel, all the Emacs rack is on another panel, all the Emulator 4 has its own panel, all of the BeatStep Pro has its own panel, and all of the effects units have their own panels. The reason is, when I have to do maintenance, I have to pull the entire panel off. And trust me, that is such a pain in the neck. Because when you pull stuff off, you risk breaking other stuff, because there is so much stuff going on behind that patch bay. And plus, it's really heavy. There's about 1,500 feet of cable attached to that patch bay in this tiny studio because everything is patched up. Moving is a terrifying, terrifying ordeal, and that thing's heavy, and the weight of all those cables makes a lot of breaks. Going through finding and repairing those breaks is not a fun adventure. I'd rather be making music. Clearly mark everything, and if you can, when you get them laser cut, mark it then. But remember, stuff's probably going to change, because you'll notice my patch bay, stuff's changed, and it looks kind of messy, just as long as you can read it. And get it laser cut, don't drill it, because laser cutting is really neat, and you can fit more stuff on the panel if it's really neatly laser cut. Remember to shield the audio cables, so make sure it's hot cold with the shield wrapped around it because behind there the audio cables run past transformers and power and all sorts of things that wants to put hums and buzz and noise into the audio signal path. Shielding will stop that. For CV gate, trig and clock signals you can use really cheap networking cable. It doesn't have to be shielded. Networking cable as I said it's really cheap but it's also really robust and you can get miles and miles of it for nothing. I have miles and miles of it here and it's great. Build lots of multiples into the patch bay because they are so handy. I have 16, that's four by four on mine. Man, I could have done with another 16 or 32. I have multiples patched all over my synth because trust me, you need them all the time. And while you're at it, build some really simple passive 
attenuators. So they have little volume knobs that turn the volume down. They're cheap, they're really easy to make, and they are so handy. Now, remember, you need a way to handle all the different volume levels because you're going to be dealing with like regular synthesizers and samplers, and volume comes out of them at regular line level. Then you're going to be working with uh, guitar pedals. Now, guitar pedals come out at an instrument level, which is very, very quiet. Then you're going to be working with modular synths, and modular synths have a crazy, crazy loud level. I use an 8-way DI, and it can either turn the volume up by about 30 dB or turn it down by about 50 dB. So that's how I can monitor the level. The only problem with it is it's a little tiny bit noisy. But that's where the compressor comes into it because the compressor can attenuate and amplify and it's very, very quiet. And be aware of the differences of the volume levels because the huge differences in those volumes can blow your speakers or damage your ears. Always monitor stuff with low volumes and make sure you know what's going on. So here's some examples of how the patch bay is used in this live track. Okay, well let's talk about the drum track. The first thing is that the drums are coming off the Emacs rack. There are two sounds coming off that. So they're all coming off the beat step. One is the actual drums, which sound like this. And the other one is the kick drum. So what's going on is that the kick drum is coming out. I've panned it to go out the right output. Here it is, up here, terribly marked. So that's my Emacs left and right. So the left side, is coming out of the Emacs left and going into compressor number four. So if we hear that kick drum just as it is, it sounds like this. So that's the kick drum straight. So you'll notice there's a gate on it and it's being pretty heavily compressed. The attack time's giving it a really nice snap and the uh, end of it is keeping it really solid. What's going on then is that goes to a multiple and then that multiple is driving all these guys here and it's using the kick drum as a side chain. The other side comes out of the right side and it travels all the way up here into five. So that's it without, a whole bunch of nothing going on there. And you'll hear there's a gate going on and it's really heavily compressed. And it's also got that kick drum in there. So that's the kick drum and the kick drum is pushing it down as the side chain. So that really heavy compression is only kicking in when the kick drum comes in and pushes the sound down. We do the two together like that. So then it comes out of five, goes straight to the desk. And this is my little mini patch bay for the desk. So each of these comes out of here and goes to the desk. So this is currently my favorite favorite module. This is the BD-9 by Hex Inverter, and it's the meanest, nastiest drum in the world. Probably not in the world, but it's pretty damn nasty. Anyway, so this is what's happening. It's coming out of the beat step right there, and that comes out here on beat step three. Beat step three, see how well that's labeled? I'm being sarcastic now. And this goes into the Mutant BD-9 at the trigger input. Now I've got some other things going on here as well. As you can see here on the beat step, output number eight is just falling on the beat. And that is getting multiplied here. It goes to the accent input of the beat step. So what's happening? Every kick drum that falls on the beat is getting an accent trigger with it. The next fun thing is that I've got this guy here sending a trigger. This is output five is sending a trigger signal. So that comes out of beat step five travels up here to this envelope generator. See where it's making that sound? Boom, boom, boom. And that cable is going into the sub level. So that is delivering an envelope to shape the sub of the Mutant BD-09. If I pull it out, it sounds like this. So you hear how there's no sub shape in that going on? And if I put this in, now you can hear it add color to that sub because that is going to the sub input. The next one is six. So six only hits on the one beat. So it hits on the first beat and six comes up here and six travels to here. This input here comes out here and goes into the amp input. Now, if I pull this out, there it is in again. You hear how it's making the one slam. So the next really fun thing is the K2000 pad. Now I'm going to get into MIDI and the way that the K2000, which is the master synth, runs everything at a later date. But just for now, 
This is what it sounds like. And also, FYI, there's a different sound there. But this is the sound we're looking on. Oh yeah, a bit of distortion there. Okay, so the K2000 is actually coming out of the B output. I have it assigned to the B output and I'm just taking B left and I'm running it into the phaser. So this is the bad stone phaser and it's a beautiful sounding phaser. It's so fat and gorgeous and it just makes everything sound luscious. So once it comes out of the phaser, it then goes into this DI and the DI is turning it up by 20 dB because when it comes out of the phaser, it's actually really quiet. Then it goes out of the DI into compressor number six and it's being side chained by the kick drum. So we will hear this. Now, if I stop the kick drum, it sounds like this. But then you'll hear the kick drum side chaining it. Super pretty. Then it comes out of six and it comes all the way over to the spring reverb, which is adding extra sexification. Love this thing. Beautiful sounding machine. Then that goes into desk input six and then it goes into the desk. I am adding a little tiny bit of delay and reverb from the desk, but not too much to hide the, the spring because I love the sound of the spring reverb. So this one's my favorite. This is the Moog. This is fun. This is really fun. And then I can actually um, really screw with things and it's, it's delicious. So what I'm doing there is I'm turning up the amount of distortion that's coming through and craziness that's coming through from the old Korg delay. Let's see what happens here. And you'll notice everything's patched up here. So let's have a look. So it's coming out of the mini Moog mix out. And this is the mix that comes just before the filters. And it's going all the way over here to the in of the Korg SDD1000. I love this thing. It's awesome. It's just the most best sounding delay ever. Anyway, and it comes out here. So what's going on is that it's set up to be sort of a, a chorus and flanger. Thing I love about this thing, look, knobs. There are no presets, there are just knobs. And this thing sounds beautiful. I love it. So anyway, it then comes out of here and then it goes back into the Moog. So basically it pulls it out just before the filter and it inserts it back in just before the filter. So the Moog is currently being mixed with this gorgeous sound. And in fact, if I bypass it, we'll hear what it actually sounds like. The bypass is now off and the effect is back in. Love it. So once it comes out of there, the Moog actually turns up here on the desk. I've got a little bit of reverb on it and a little bit of delay on it. Sounds wonderful. I love it. So that's the patch bay. There's a lot more fun stuff I can do. For example, I didn't even get into the chaos pad and some of the weird stuff I got from some zero inertia and all that crazy stuff. We'll get into that at later ones. But for now, that's the patch bay. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this has inspired you to do something wild. Creating art is a really fun voyage. It's a fun journey. And it's even more fun when you put yourself on the edge and you allow yourself to fail. Don't be afraid to fail. Like obviously you'll learn from the failures, but sometimes in those failures, there are some really amazing, happy accidents. So go out, do something wild with your art. You are awesome. You rock. Rock.